everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is another installment in the Sewing Through the Decades series where I follow original vintage patterns and share the process and sometimes puzzling instructions with all of you. To see previous videos in this series, you can check out the playlist linked in the upper right hand corner and for behind the scenes stuff you can check out my Patreon which is funding this whole project. Today I'm carrying on with another pattern for the 1940s and making something that is rarely seen on this channel. Pants. Fun fact, I've made more 1630s evening costumes in my life than I have pairs of pants, which isn't saying much since I made a single pair of pants prior to this, but they were really great, very understated pants. Anyway, the pattern I'm focusing on today is a McCall's printed pattern that was copyrighted in 1942. It's pattern number 4803 and is probably the simplest pattern I've followed so far since it consists of a mere four pieces. The instructions are quite minimal, with only a few paragraphs of text spread out over the sheet. Luckily there are lots of diagrams, so it was still pretty easy to follow. As for fabric, I picked this medium weight striped twill. It's an odd olivey brownish grayish khaki tone that was impossible to find matching thread for, but it was the perfect weight for pants and holds the shape of them quite nicely. I pre-washed my material, then laid it out, and began pinning the pieces to it. I tried to pay attention to the grain lines marked on the pattern pieces and make sure that they lined up with the stripes on the fabric. I purchased this pattern in a size 26, and in pants I really need a size 28, so you'll see me adding a half inch of allowance down the side edge of the pants, and I'm also adding two inches to the hem since they ran quite short. However, I'm not adding additional seam allowance because I didn't assemble this with French seams. I know, it's shocking. <laughs> I intended on overcasting or top stitching the seam allowance down to help prevent it from fraying. And neither of those finishing methods require additional seam allowance. So after marking everything out, I cut the pieces out and notched them accordingly. I also cut out the pocket piece and the piece for the waistband, and I made sure to add two inches of extra length to the waistband to account for the additions I made to the side of the pant pieces. Now onto the actual instructions. Step one is make inside tucks in front sections by stitching together along dotted lines and make darts in back sections. So I'm transferring those markings from the pattern onto the fabric using chalk. Then I'm using a ruler to connect the markings and provide better guidelines, and I'm just pinning the darts in place. The tucks are marked and pinned in much the same manner, but instead of tapering off to a point like darts, the tucks are open-ended. I find these unintuitive to do since I'm so used to darts, but I really like the effect they give. Where darts remove volume and fabric from something, tucks just displace and control the volume. I'd really like to incorporate them more in my work, I just always forget that they are a technique that exists. All of the darts and tucks were sewn by machine. Then these were ironed, and I made sure to iron the tucks away from the center of the pants so the volume is directed away from the crotch region. 1940s pants are cut quite generously in the crotch region to begin with. <laughs> the next instruction said to join side seams, leaving free above circles. The portion above the circles will function as the closure point on the left side and have a pocket inserted on the right side. The rest was pinned normally and sewn with a half inch allowance. I ironed the seam open in preparation for seam finishing method one, which is overcasting the seams. This consists of whip stitching the seam allowance down to the top layer of material. You're only supposed to catch a few threads of the top fabric to avoid the stitches being visible when the garment's worn. Unfortunately, this fabric was so densely woven that I couldn't catch enough threads of the top layer fabric to make this effective. And when I did catch enough threads, the stitch was too large and you could see it. So I moved on to option two, which was top stitching the seam allowance down. But I couldn't find a thread that matched well, and this fabric was so dense that the stitching sat on top of the fabric in a way that looked awful. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough allowance to re-sew these seams as a French seam, or enough allowance to paint the edges, which is mentioned several times on the pattern as being a way to properly finish the seams. I was confident that bias binding was going to make the seams too bulky and didn't really feel like I had any other options, so I decided to leave the seams free. I'm going to hand wash these to limit fraying, and hopefully they will hold up okay, but I can definitely update you at some point in the future. With that step skipped, I jumped straight into what they consider step 3 and 4, which involves sewing the leg and center seams. Thank you. 
The next step is all to do with the pocket. They wanted me to face the edges of this since it is supposed to be cut from a lighter lining fabric, but I decided to cut the whole thing from matching fabric instead. Then they say, sew pocket to edges of opening. This was surprisingly tricky to do since the bottom edge extends into the already sewn side seam allowance, but needs to be pinned from the front so you can't tell if you're sewing through the right layers of fabric. In my opinion, it was unnecessarily finicky, and I feel like the pocket should have been sewn in before doing up the side seam. Then the bottom edge is stitched closed, and again you have to sew through the seam allowance of the side seam, and it's hard to tell whether you're doing it right. I actually had to redo this a couple times. But that finishes off the left side opening, so now it is onto the right side. This side can be finished with an underlap style placket or a side fastener, better known as a zipper. They have instructions for both, but I opted to use a zipper, and I had a vintage one with painted metal teeth that was perfect for this project. Their instructions for sewing this in are Turn under half inch seam allowance at opening. Stitch opening to tape of closed side fastener, stitching about one quarter inch away from turned edges. I officially love this method. I didn't even have to switch to a zipper foot since they wanted me to stitch an even quarter inch away from the teeth. So I just pinned the zipper in and stitched around it. Now onto the waistband. They say, turn waistband on line indicated and join side edges, then turn right side out. So I folded it in half lengthwise with the right sides of the fabric facing each other, and I pinned up the ends. The ends were sewn, then I clipped excess volume out of the corners, turned it right side out, and gave it a good iron. Now on to what they call belt straps. They say, fold material with raw edges meeting and join with diagonal stitches. They didn't say how wide this material should be to begin with, so I opted for one inch. Then I used my iron to turn the edges inward, and I cut the strip into equal two inch lengths. They had a diagram that showed each of these formed with a half dozen stitches, so I kept mine pretty big too. I must say, I despised this method. It was really tricky to just stitch through the back layers of the strap, and I don't feel like this is a very durable finish for an edge that will be quite abused over time. I think the edges should be folded inward and overlap, or that these should be sewn as a tube and then turned right side out and top stitched. But this project is, in part at least, about following methods listed, so I carried on. The instructions for securing the waistband and belt straps are sew inner edge of waistband to slacks, then top stitch outer edges to position over seam. I think they intend for you to pin the straps to the waistband, but that seemed finicky. So to make sure they wouldn't shift around, I pinned them onto the pants first. Then I pinned the waistband on with the right side facing the wrong side of the pants. I was honestly a little worried this method would make it difficult to stitch all the way to the corners, but it worked surprisingly well and I stitched this on with a half inch allowance. In fact, everything for this pattern was stitched with half inch allowances as they instructed. Here I'm tucking the bottom edge of the front side of the waistband inward, and I used the stitching from securing the other side of the waistband as a guide for where to turn this edge. I also made sure to pin the straps upward so they'd be top stitched into a perkier position. I top stitched around the bottom edge and the sides of the waistband. As you can see, some of the waistband extended past the side edge, which I don't think is right, so I must have added too much extra length to it when cutting it out. But it worked to my advantage later on, so it's fine. The next step was sewing the upper ends of the belt straps into position. I did this with whip stitches, but if I had a better matching thread, I probably would have top stitched across the top edges of these, since I think details like that are nice on more utilitarian garments. I like how these ended up looking on the finished pants, but they're really not very practical, at least not very practical for the belts that I currently have in my collection. The straps are only supposed to be about half the width of the finished waistband, which means they have an opening of a little over a half inch, so I actually put my belt over top of the belt loops when I was taking worn photos of this. Weirdly enough, they had no information about closing the top portion of the waistband. I assume they want it to close with hooks, but I really like buttons on waistbands, so I used my machine to stitch a buttonhole into the side front of the waistband. And I went over it several times to make sure the stitching was dense enough. The buttonhole was snipped open and fray checked. Then I sewed a button onto the other side of the waistband, and this is where that extra material comes in handy. It serves as a modesty panel of sorts, so you don't see skin through the buttonhole. Not that that would really be an issue unless you decide to wear these pants without a shirt, which I probably won't be doing, but you never know. 
Also, projects that only require one button make me so happy because it means I get to use up those sad, lonely, singular buttons that I have hanging out in my stash. And the last thing to do was hem these guys. This pattern offered several hemming options. A plain hem, which is done by turn in raw edge and machine stitch, turn up hem and slip stitch to garment, which is pretty much how I hem everything. And option two is called hemming with binding. Stitch binding to the edge of the hem, then slip stitch binding to garment. Though I like both methods, I went for the first option. So the bottom edges were turned inward by half inch and stitched down. Then I tried the pants on and decided they only need to be taken up by half inch. So I turned the bottom edge inward once again and slip stitched it in place. Unfortunately, I forgot to crease the slacks before wearing them, which is a crucial part of creating the 1940s shape, so I'm quite upset. But in my defense, this step isn't part of the rest of the instructions, and it's off to the side in between seam finishing methods. And who really cares about those? But if we ignore that fact, then the pants are done! I paired them with a homemade blouse, which will also be part of the Sewing Through the Decade series, along with a brown leather belt, a pair of matching loafers, and a wool cap that I purchased in an antique store. I love this cap, it makes me feel ready to captain a train, or drive a train, or conduct a train, or have some sort of involvement in the movement of a train. I'm pretty sure conduct is the word I was looking for there. <laughs> I also really love this as an outfit. I think it's so, so cute. And though none of the pieces are dramatic on their own, together it paints a very 1940s-ish picture, and I'm very happy about it. It does make me feel a little bit like I should be called grandpa when I'm wearing it, but I'm okay with that. If that's the role I have to take to wear this, then so be it. <laughs> As for my thoughts on the pants, I don't know if you can tell, but I kind of treated these like a really fancy mock-up towards the end because I was so displeased with the material and my inability to properly finish the edges. The lighter top stitching also drove me crazy, and I didn't think I added enough allowance for these to actually fit over my hips. So I kind of screwed up everything you can with such a simple pattern, but I ended up really liking the finished pants. I think they are a great color and I think I'll get a lot of wear out of them. And I like this pattern enough that as I'm filming this, I've actually already made these from a different fabric and I'm super pleased with those as well. So despite the issues, I'd say this was a success and I'm hopeful that the other 1940s patterns in this series will be as well. And if you enjoyed this, then giving this video a like and a comment really helps me out. And thanks again for watching. I shall talk to all of you very soon.